One of my specialties is Rhapsody in Blue. I don't know if you like to feel like you're in school, <laughs> but I do have like a three minute sort of introduction to it. If you want to hear it, it's kind of totally fascinating. In the 1890s, there was a woman named Jeanette Thurber, and she was a very wealthy philanthropist in New York. And she had a mission to show the world, and well, the United States, that African Americans and Native Americans had talent, and that the music of the New World could be independent from Europe through Native American and African American elements. So she approached Dvorak in Czechoslovakia because he was one of the most famous composers in the world and wrote to him, could you come and teach at my new conservatory and write the New World Symphony? So he liked her letters, and because of that, he came and then gave interviews where he said, if you're an American composer and you write European music, you're probably not going to do it as well as we do. So why don't you use Native American or an African American elements? And this was not very popular at the time because. Uh, it was a little bit like saying you're racist and mediocre too. <laughs> <clears throat> and there was a composer who was very, very cultured, one of the most cultured people of the whole 19th century America, who had started the first music school at Harvard. And the goal uh, of his was so that Americans in the United States could sit through an entire Beethoven symphony. <laughs> and he was achieving this, so it was a really great thing. But then along comes Dvorak, that's all very nice, why don't you get your own world? So it's a sort of a big, it's a big thing that happened in history. And with racism and everything, there was a lot of people that it would be their worst nightmare if the basis of genius were African American. But Gershwin studied with Goldmark. Goldmark was a student of Dvorak. And Goldmark told Gershwin and his family, who was a family that would have sent him to school, they were very upper class, and that would have been the thing to do, go to school. But he told them, please, do not let him go to school. And you won't find this at any school, they won't tell you this. But that is what happened. So he didn't go to school, not because he was so independent, but because his teacher told him not to go to school. So instead, he went to the School of Hard Knocks, in a way, and became a song plugger in New York and tried to write hits. And he wrote one, Swanee, and it made him famous, but nobody was going to take that seriously as a great piece of music. But in Europe, they were starting to have concerts of jazz for the classical concert hall, and Stravinsky and Mio and Hindemith and Sati were all writing jazz for the concert hall, ragtime and jazz. But Americans thought jazz was music of the devil, and even a lot of a lot of blacks thought it was music of the devil because in their church they were told that. So they his Gershwin's presenters told him they were having a concert at Aeolian Hall to bring jazz into classical music and they wanted him to write a concerto and uh, he would be like the star of the 
program, but because he knew that Americans believed jazz was music of the devil, he didn't take them seriously, didn't even bother with it. It was like, oh yeah, right. And then he's walking down the street, and he sees his name on the marquee. Gershwin's concerto, and it's two weeks away. And he hasn't written a concerto. And he actually doesn't even know what a concerto is, because he didn't go to school. But without going to school a few years later, in two months, he taught himself orchestration and wrote the most immortal concerto of any American. So, he, um, at this time, had not learned orchestration, so he went to his sketchbooks, and then he gave, he wrote Rhapsody in Blue, he didn't have time to write a concerto, he wrote Rhapsody in Blue, and he gave it to Ferdy Griffay, who has a very romantic, sort of syrupy style that works beautifully for Ferdy Griffay, not so great for Gershwin, who hated smooth jazz and sentiment. His music's very romantic, but it gets more romantic if you do what he actually said that nobody ever listens to, which is take the pedal off more and make sudden sharp accents. When you do that, you find out you have to go to the gym. <laughs> because he's like an extension of Liszt with the pyrotechnical ability to turn a piano into an orchestra like Liszt could do. He could take a orchestral piece and make it into a piano piano work and have the whole orchestra at the piano. Well, Gershwin did that with Rhapsody in Blue after it was premiered, and nobody ever mentions this, but you'll notice that it's a super virtuoso piece, and that it has incredible originality in the, the way that he makes the pianist have to do all of those things at once, the piano and the orchestra, it's very, very difficult to keep up, especially when you're in Guatemala, not practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is Rhapsody in Blue and Gershwin's own version. 